Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Can poetry change the world? There is ample evidence that it has in the past. Poems inspire everything from religious fervor to revolution, patriotism to global diversity. Poetry both reflects its subject matter and changes it. But art became more complex in the latter half of the 20th century with the rise of advertising and of escapist entertainment. Images, fashions, trends, and brandings interact with creative expression and bombard our senses. Artists find themselves competing with a number of sensations designed to capture our attention and move us towards specific thoughts, feelings, and actions. Every advertisement we encounter uses creative expression to encourage us to change, at the very least, our buying habits. At the same time, advertisements reinforce many existing social expectations. The beat novelist William S. Burroughs wrote, quote, Artists, to my mind, are the real architects of change, and not political legislators, who implement change after the fact. Art exerts a profound influence on the style of life, the mode, range, and direction of perception. Art tells us what we know and don't know that we know, close quote. Burroughs wrote this passage nearly 50 years ago. He wrote before Andy Warhol made soup cans a work of art. He wrote before music videos and burnable CDs and the internet. Is his assertion still true? Can art still create social change? The poet Audre Lorde once lamented the loss of an avenue of expression for poor women, the poetry section of the so-called ladies' magazines. Poetry is the most available expression of art for the poor, she asserted, because it requires the least amount of technology to produce. Imagination and a pencil and piece of scrap paper at the dining room table after the children have gone to bed is all that is needed to be a poet. Ladies' magazines used to publish submissions of poetry from women in the back of each issue. Here was a place for even the poorest of women to express their thoughts and feelings. Poetry, she asserted, is not a luxury for women's expressions. But Lord hit the nail right on the head in pointing out that the publication of poetry is an important aspect of that expression. Who gets heard and who doesn't get heard is a political and social phenomenon. If poetry is an avenue of social change, then publication of that poetry is an avenue of social maintenance, and some would say staleness. On today's show, we offer a series of readings from the Academy of American Poets online listening room. We have chosen these poets because they represent poetry that has not only been published, but is now taught in schools around the world. In many ways, these are the acceptable poets, and that makes them less threatening. But some of them weren't so acceptable in their own time. Some of these poets are acceptable now because they dare to be different then. Cummings experimented radically with form, punctuation, spelling, and syntax, abandoning traditional techniques and structures to create a new, highly idiosyncratic means of poetic expression. Later in his career, he was often criticized for settling into his signature style and not pressing his work towards further evolution. Nevertheless, he attained great popularity especially among young readers, for the simplicity of his language, his playful style, and his attention to subjects such as war and sex. 
Why must itself up every of a park anus stick some quote statue unquote to prove that a hero equals any jerk who is afraid to dare to answer no. Quote, citizens, unquote, might otherwise forget to err is human, to forgive divine, that if the, quote, state, unquote, says, kill, killing is an act of Christian love. Nothing in 1944 A.D. can stand against the argument of military necessity. Generalissimo E. And Echo answers, There is no appeal from reason. Freud, you pays your money and you doesn't take your choice. Ain't freedom grand? W.H. Auden's 1930 collection, Poems, established him as the leading voice of a new generation. Ever since then, he has been admired for his unsurpassed technical virtuosity and an ability to write poems in nearly every imaginable verse form, for incorporation in his work of popular culture, current events, and vernacular speech, and for the vast range of his intellect, which drew easily from an extraordinary variety of literatures, art forms, social and political theories, and scientific and technical information. His poetry frequently recounts, literally or metaphorically, a journey or quest and his travels provided rich material for his verse. Auden was born in the United Kingdom and was made poet laureate of that nation, but he spent most of his life in the United States. Among Palatian travelers, lost on their new conceited way to Massachusetts, Michigan, Miami, or LA, an airborne instrument I sit, predestined nightly to fulfill Columbia Geese and Management's unfathomable will. By whose election justified, I bring my gospel of the muse to fundamentalists, to nuns, to Gentiles, and to Jews, and daily seven days a week before a local sense is jailed, from talking site to talking site, and jet or prop propelled. Though warm I welcome everywhere, I shift so frequently, so fast, I cannot now tell where I was the evening before last. Unless some singular event should intervene to save the place, a truly asinine remark, a soul-bewitching face, or a blessed encounter full of joy, unscheduled on the decent fan, with here an addict of Tolkien, there a Charles Williams fan. Since merit but a dunghill is, I mount the rostrum unafraid. Indeed, for damnable to ask, if I am overpaid. Spirit is willing to repeat without a qualm the same old talk, but flesh is homesick for our snug apartment in New York. A sulky 56, he finds a change in mealtime utter hell, grown far too crotchety to like a luxury hotel. The Bible is a goodly book I always can peruse with zest but really cannot say the same for Hilton's Be My Guest. <laughs> Nor bear with equanimity the radio in students' cars, Muzak at breakfast, or, dear God, girl organists in bars. <laughs> and worst of all, the anxious thought, each time my plane begins to sink and a no-smoking sign comes on, what will there be to drink? Is this Amelia where I must how gray and greenish, how infra-dig, snatched from the bottle in my bag 
an analeptic swig. Another morning comes, I see, dwindling below me on the plain, the roofs of one more audience I shall not see again. God bless the lot of them, although I don't remember which was which. God bless the USA, so large, so friendly, and so rich. <laughs> Gwendolyn Brooks was an African-American poet who wrote more than 20 books of poetry and numerous other books, including a novel and an autobiography. Her style captured her experiences growing up and living in Chicago, where she stayed until her death in 2000 at the age of 83. We real cool, we left school, we learnt light, we strike straight, we sing. Sin we, then gin we, jazz June we, die soon. Allen Ginsberg was one of the founding members of what came to be known as the Beat Generation. His first published poem, How, overcame censorship to become one of the most widely read poems of the century. Ginsberg studied under gurus and Zen masters. He went on to co-found and direct the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics in Colorado. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman? For I walk down the side streets under the trees with a headache, self-conscious, looking at the full moon. In my hungry fatigue and shopping for images, I went into the neon fruit supermarket, dreaming of your enumeration. What peaches and what the numbers? Whole family shopping at night. Isles full of husbands, wives in the avocados, babies in the tomatoes, and you, Garcia Lorca, what were you doing down by the watermelons? I saw you, Walt Whitman, childless, lonely old grubber, poking among the meats in the refrigerator and eyeing the grocery boys. I heard you asking questions of each. Who killed the pork chops? What price bananas? Are you my angel? I wandered in and out of the brilliant stacks of cans, following you and followed in my imagination by the store detective. We strolled down the open corridors together in our solitary fancy, tasting artichokes, possessing every frozen delicacy and never passing the cashier. Which way are we going, Walt Whitman? The doors close in an hour. Which way does your beard point tonight? I touch your book and dream of our odyssey in the supermarket and feel absurd. Will we walk all night through solitary streets? The trees add shade to shade, lights out in the houses. We'll both be lonely. Will we stroll dreaming of the lost America of love past blue automobiles and driveways home to our silent cottage? Ah, dear father, graybeard, lonely old courage teacher, what America did you have when Charon quit pulling his ferry and you got out on a smoking bank and stood watching the boat disappear on the black waters of Lethe? Anne Sexton suffered greatly from postpartum depression, having breakdowns after each of her two children's births. Upon advice of her doctor, after an attempted suicide in 1957, she decided to pursue poetry as a way to get out of her depression. In poetry, she found an expression that helped her endure life. However, she succumbed to the depression and committed suicide in 1974 at the age of 46. Sexton offers the reader an intimate view of the emotional anguish that characterized her life. She made the experience of being a woman a central issue in her poetry, and though she endured criticism for bringing subjects like menstruation, abortion, and drug addiction into her poems, her skill as a poet transcended the controversies over her subject matter. I have gone out to possessed witch, haunting the black air, braver at night, dreaming evil I have done my hitch over the plain houses, light by light, lonely thing, twelve-fingered, out of mind. A woman like that is not a woman, quite. I have been her kind. 
I have found the warm caves in the woods, fill them with skillets, carvings, shells, closets, silks, innumerable goods. Fix the suppers for the worms and the owls, whining, rearranging the disalarmed. A woman like that is misunderstood. I have been her kind. I have ridden in your cart, driver, waved my nude arms at villages going by, learning the last bright roots, survivor where your flames still bite my thigh, and my ribs crack where your wheels wind. A woman like that is not ashamed to die. I have been her kind. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvic.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Audrey Lord was a black woman, a mother, a daughter, a lesbian, a feminist, and an activist. Her poetry, as well as her essays and novels, reflected all of her experiences in life and left her open to a great deal of criticism. In an interview in the journal Kowloon, Lord responded to her critics, quote, My sexuality is part and parcel of who I am and my poetry comes from the intersection of me and my worlds. Jesse Holmes' objection to my work is not about obscenity or even about sex. It is about revolution and change, aimed at his destruction and the destruction of every single thing he stands for." Close quote. A song for many movements. Nobody wanted to die on the way, caught between ghosts of whiteness and the real water, None of us wanted to leave our bones on the way to salvation. Three planets to the left a century of light years ago. Our spices are separate and particular, but our skins sing in complementary keys. At a quarter to eight, meantime, we were telling the same stories over and over and over. But broken down gods survive in the crevasses and mud pots of every beleaguered city where it is obvious there are too many bodies to cart to the ovens or gallows and our uses have become more important than our silence. After the fall, too many empty cases of blood to bury or burn and there will be nobody left to listen. Our labor has become more important than our silence. Our labor has become more important than our silence. Joy Harjo is a Native American poet who performs her poetry and plays saxophone with her band Poetic Justice. She is also a filmmaker and scriptwriter. She is active in promoting Native arts and educating young people about poetry and Native culture. Post-colonial tale. Every day is a reenactment of the creation story. We emerge from dense, unspeakable material through the shimmering power of dreaming stuff. This is the first world and the last. Once we abandon ourselves for television, the box that separates the dreamer from the dreaming. It was as if we were stolen, put into a bag, carried on the back of a white man who pretends to own the earth and the sky. In the sack were all the people of the world. We fought until there was a hole in the bag. When we fell, we were not aware of falling. We were driving to work to the mall. The children were in school learning subtraction with guns. We found ourselves somewhere near the diminishing point of civilization, not far from the trickster's bag of tricks. 
Everything was as we imagined it, the earth and stars, every creature and leaf imagined with us. When we fell, we were not aware of falling. We were driving to work or to the mall. The children were in school learning subtraction with guns. The imagining needs praise, as does any living thing. We are evidence of this praise, and when we laugh, we're indestructible. No story or song will translate the full impact of falling or the inverse power of rising up, of rising up. Our children put down their guns when we did to imagine with us. We imagined the shining link between the heart and the sun. We imagined tables of food for everyone. We imagined the songs. The imagination, conversely, illumined us, spoke with us, sang with us, danced with us, drummed with us, loved us. Catherine Anderson is the author of a collection of poems entitled In the Mother Tongue. She lives and works in Boston's immigrant communities. Her work lies at the intersection of sexism, ethnocentrism, and working class values. Womanhood. She slides over the hot upholstery of her mother's car, the schoolgirl of 15 who loves humming and swaying with the radio. Her entry into womanhood will be like all the other girls, a cigarette and a joke, as she strides up with the rest to the brick factory where she'll sew rag rugs from textile strips of Kelly Green, bright red, aqua. When she enters and the mill gate closes, final as a slap, there'll be silence. She'll see 15 high windows cemented over to cut out light. Inside, a constant deafening noise and warm air smelling of oil, the shifts continuing on. All day she'll guide cloth along a line of whirring needles her arms and shoulders rocking back and forth with the machines, 200 porch-sized rugs behind her before she can stop to reach up like her mother and pick the lint out of her hair. Raphael Campo, born in 1964, is the youngest of the poets whose work is available in the Academy of American Poets Listening Room. His poems, essays, and reviews have appeared in several publications and he has authored three books of poetry published in the 1990s. He is also a practicing physician at Harvard Medical School and the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Admitted to the hospital again. The second bout of pneumocystis back in January almost killed him. Then he'd sworn to us he'd die at home. He baked us cookies which the student wouldn't eat before he left. The kitchen on 5A is small, but serviceable and neat. He told me stories. Richard Gere was gay and sleeping with a friend of his, and AIDS was an elaborate conspiracy affected by the government. He stayed four weeks. He lost his sight to CMV. One day, I drew his blood, and while I did, he laughed and said I was his girlfriend now, his blood brother. Vampire slut, he cried. You'll make me live forever. Wrinkled brows were all I managed in reply. I know I'm drowning in his blood, his purple blood. I filled my seven tubes. The warmth was slow to leave them, pressed inside my palm. I'm sad because he doesn't see my face, because I can't identify with him. I hate the fact that he's my age and that across my skin he's there, my blood brother, my mate. He said I was too nice, and after all, if Jodie Foster was a lesbian, then doctors could be queer. Residual guilt tingled down my spine. Okay, I'm done, I said as I withdrew the needle from his back and pressed. The CSF was clear. I never answered him. That spot was framed in sterile paper drapes. He was so near death, telling him seemed pointless. Then he died. 
unrecognizable to anyone but me, he left my needle deep inside his joking heart. An autopsy was done. I'd read to him at night. His horoscope, the New York Times, the Advocate, some lines by Richard Howard gave us hope. A quiet hospital is infinite. The polished, ice-white floors, the darkened halls that lead to almost anywhere, to death or ghostly lighted coke machines. I called to him one night, at home, asleep. His breath, I dreamed, had filled my lungs. His lips, my lips had touched. I felt as though I touched a shrine, not disrespectfully, but in some lapse of concentration. In a mirror shines the distant moon. This website you came across was quite a find. Yeah, it was. Um, it has a great listening room with most of the poems being read by the poets themselves. And it has 102 poems in the listening room right now. All of them you just click on and listen right from the website. Streaming audio. Uh, and we're talking about Robert Frost and E.E. E. Cummings and all of those poets that we were exposed to, well, we were, I don't know if Canadians were or not, in school growing up. Uh, but I did a little bit of surveying of the 102 poems that were there. Uh, some of the, I'm not saying poets because some of the poems, some of the poets had more than one poem in the listening room. And I think the thing that struck me the most when I first picked up on the listening room was that they were all baby boomers or older. Most of them have already passed away. The Academy of American Poets was formed in 1934. So these were mostly 20th century poets, uh, many of whom were born in the late 19th century. But uh, the youngest who we included in our reading, Raphael Campbell, was born in 1964, which pretty much doesn't make him a baby boomer, but pretty much puts him at the end of the baby boomer generation, the bulge, as it were, in population history. Most of them were born before 1954. In fact, if I were among them, I would be among the youngest. Most of them were born before 1954, many of them were born before 1940. If I were among them, I would be the youngest. Yes. I'll say that without being more specific. What do you think this reflects? Well, it could reflect two things that came to mind. First is 
that it takes a while to get recognized as a poet. I mean, 1964 means that Campo is 37, 38 years old right now, right? It takes a while to get, get through, make publications, get a book published, and so forth. So it might just be, I mean, most of these poets probably weren't recognized until their late 30s or early 40s. It might just be the nature of things, the nature of recognition at this level. But I suspect that there also might be a big division here, pre and post baby boomer generation, in terms of the support of poetry. Uh, poetry was a more valid art form and had much more recognition in universities than it does today, I think. This is an observation from the outside looking in. I'm certainly not a literature professor and I've not worked in academics in literature departments. However, that wasn't for lack of trying. <laughs> because I did apply to several creative writing programs when I was looking to go to my master's degree, looking to get my master's degree. And everywhere that I looked at and or applied to had a ratio of about 150 applicants to about eight seats. I mean, it was extremely competitive. And I was summarily rejected everywhere that I applied. It wasn't a thorough search on my part, but it was certainly disheartening. I like writing poetry, and I like writing short stories. I like writing. And I thought that it would be nice to connect with a community in doing that, and that door was pretty well slammed shut in my face. And I'm not real clear on why. I have some speculations. We'll go ahead and speculate. It's our show. <laughs> well, I suspect that you have to know somebody. And I think that, that was, that's also something I noted in this listening room, is when I read the little bios on the poets and so forth, it was clear that a number of them had sat at the feet of others of them, that there was, a, there was mentoring connections and community connections among the people who were listed there. And so there's a kind of... I mean, that's sort of good. I mean, that's part of what you're looking for if you're an artist, is to find a community of artists. But it's also kind of bad if you're not part of the community because you're the outsider looking in. And so I, I suspect that one of the problems I had is that I had no particular sponsor, if you will, at these institutions. And that probably the eight seats went to people that the professorship knew and wanted to uh, support in their career. And do you think that's a trend? No, no, I think that's the way it's always been. If anything, I think maybe the trend might be in the opposite direction with poetry slams going on and a number of people publishing poetry on the internet and so forth. There, there may be an opposite trend going on that more people are poets and more poets are getting published and so forth. But I don't know that that comes with the community, that the kind of old-time academic setting provided for literary people, the, the kind of social support that's provided. I think that universities provide legitimation for poets, and it's been an uneasy marriage from the beginning, yeah. with poets wanting to be, well, solvent but at the same time not wanting to appear too mainstream, too co-opted, otherwise the artistic essence is lost or something of that nature. And I think that that's what went missing in the last generation. The reason the youngest poet on the website was born in 1964, and no more recently than that, is that universities aren't interested in maintaining what they once maintained, that is, an appreciation of the parts of culture that go missing otherwise. Indeed, if they go missing otherwise nowadays, the university wants no part of them. Yeah, the universities seem to be moving towards a direction of market-based education. So-called. Yeah, and poets don't, don't make money. I mean, what do you do if you're artistic now and you walk into a university degree? You study advertising. You study graphic arts. 
you study, you know, different aspects of, of commercialization, that's how you make money if you're an artist. The universities are set up to support that. And I think it shows. But I think it's also the nature of the Academy of American Poets to be an organization that only recognizes people after they get to a certain point. It still was pretty radical. I mean, the group, like the group of poems that we, we shared earlier, I would say that I think it was five or six of the poets are openly gay. Uh, a number of them were people of color. And that was true throughout the listening room. Um, I mean, you had your share of older white guys. Does it compromise poetry to point out in a specific case that the poet is far from marginalized? I would ask the other question, namely, does poetry have to be marginalized? But I want to, I want to point to the criticism of it, the reflection on it. The specific example I have in mind is William Carlos Williams, who was American, who was a physician, and who was a respected poet. Respected by whom being the issue here. Sure. Go ahead. Tell me well, more. The point is he was not exactly Jean Genet in terms of what he did when he wasn't writing. He was quite comfortable in the quote mainstream close quote in the course of his daily life. So as long as he did his job and fulfilled his Protestant work ethic, then he was allowed to write poetry? I'm asking you. And I think you could make an argument for that, but I think you could also argue that there are, are a bunch of people out there who at least start out pretty bohemian, start out pretty anti-work ethic, but they get co-opted very fast. I mean, one could argue that Ginsburg ended his life fairly in the mainstream. I mean, he was a professor at, I cannot remember what university, I would think that, yes, you're right, but not totally. I mean, I think there are a lot of people doing poetry out there who are doing poetry in a radical way, who are, in fact, pushing a few envelopes. But they're not going to show up in the Academy of American Poets, and they're not going to show up in an anthology that is found in college campuses in introductory lit classes which is where most of these poets will end up. They're going to be read by college freshmen. One thing that you pointed out is that what is, quote, subversive, close quote, today may be, quote, common knowledge, close quote, tomorrow. I think a specific case would be the black poets of the 60s, the revolutionary ones, Amiri Baraka, Nikki Giovanni, who made no attempt to disguise their distaste, let's call it, for white culture in the United States. But today they're widely read, well regarded, and generally viewed as being not subversive as much as having a firm grasp of the obvious. As recently as the 1960s, the United States was very much a feudal society in terms of how it treated race relations. Mm -hmm. It was hierarchical, and it tried to be hierarchical. So the question becomes, did the poets follow the social changes that were occurring in the 60s, or did they create some of the social changes that were occurring in the 60s? And I would suspect, well, first of all, you know me, I would suspect both. But I would also want to make a case for the fact that I think that you needed the poet voices. You needed black poets creating a black aesthetic in order to break down white culture and the most racist aspects and the most feudalistic aspects of white culture. And I think poetry, I think Audre Lorde hit it right on the head when she said that it's not a luxury for those who live on the margins of society. Self-expression, getting your point across in an emotional way is one of the first steps towards social change, I believe. Sociologists don't study this that much. They don't look at poetry in that kind of light often, but I think that it, that it could be studied that way. It could very well be the early signs of social change. 
when people start writing about it, when they start talking about it, when they start pushing envelopes. I can think of at least one reason why that could be valid, namely that one is allowed to publish under the genre label of fiction things that one would never be permitted to publish under any other genre label. Sure, in the same way that humorists can be biting social critics, but if they were getting standing up and giving lectures, they wouldn't get away with this much. Poets can point to and make arguments in their poetry in a way that essayists can't. freely in the street and sees reality, and the things he sees are bigger than himself, and the things he sees are his reality, drunks in doorways, moons on trees. The dog trots freely through the street, and the things he sees are smaller than himself, fish on newsprint, ants in holes, chickens in Chinatown windows, their heads a block away. The dog trots freely in the street, and the things he smells smell something like himself. The dog trots freely in the street past puddles and babies, cats and cigars, pool rooms and policemen. He doesn't hate cops. He merely has no use for them. And he goes past them and past the dead cows hung up whole in front of the San Francisco meat market. He would rather eat a tender cow than a tough policeman, though either might do. And he goes past the Romeo Ravioli factory, and past Coit's Tower, and past Congressman Doyle. He's afraid of Coit's Tower, but he's not afraid of Congressman Doyle, although what he hears is very discouraging, very depressing, very absurd to a young dog like himself to a serious dog like himself. But he has his own free world to live in, his own fleas to eat. He will not be muzzled. Congressman Doyle is just another fire hydrant to him. The dog trots freely in the street and has his own dog's life to live and to think about and to reflect upon, touching and tasting and testing everything investigating everything without benefit of perjury a real realist with a real tale to tell with a real tale to tell it with a real live barking democratic dog engaged in real free enterprise with something to say about ontology something to say about reality and how to see it and how to hear it with his head cocked sideways at street corners, as if he is just about to have his picture taken for Victor Records, listening for his master's voice, and looking like a living question mark into the great gramophone of puzzling existence with its wondrous hollow horn, which always seems just about to sprout forth some victorious answer to everything.
Jurassic, about 150 million years ago, the great sun Buddha in this corner of the infinite void gave a discourse to all the assembled elements and energies, to the standing beings, the walking beings, the flying beings, and the sitting beings, even grasses, to the number of 13 billion. Each one born from a seed assembled there a discourse concerning enlightenment on the planet Earth. In some future time, there will be a continent called America. It will have great centers of power called such as Pyramid Lake, Walden Pond, Mount Rainier, Big Sur, Everglades, and so forth. And powerful nerves and channels such as Columbia River, Mississippi River, and Grand Canyon. In that era, will get into troubles all over its head and practically wreck everything in spite of its own strong, intelligent Buddha nature. The twisting strata of the great mountains and the pulses of volcanoes are my love and burning deep in the earth. My obstinate compassion is schist and basalt. showed himself in his true form of Smokey the Bear. A handsome, smoky-colored brown bear is standing on his hind legs, showing that he is aroused and watchful. Bearing in his right paw the shovel that digs to the truth beneath appearances, cuts the roots of useless attachments, and flings damp sand on the fires of greed and war. His left paw in the mudra of comradely display indicating that all creatures have the full right to live to their limits, and that deer, rabbits, chipmunks, snakes, dandelions, and lizards all grow in the realm of the Dharma. Wearing the blue work overalls, symbolic of slaves and laborers, the countless men oppressed by a civilization that claims to save but often destroys. Wearing the broad-brimmed hat of the West, symbolic of the forces that guard the wilderness, which is the natural state of the Dharma and the true path of man on earth. All true paths lead through mountains. With a halo of smoke and flame behind, the forest fires of the Kali Yuga, fires caused by the stupidity of those who think things can be gained and lost, whereas in truth all is contained vast and free in the blue sky and green earth of one mind. Bellied to show his kind nature and that the great earth has food enough for everyone who loves her and trusts her. Trampling underfoot wasteful freeways and needless suburbs, smashing the worms of capitalism and totalitarianism. Indicating the task, his followers becoming free of cars, houses, canned foods, universities, and shoes, master the three mysteries of their own body, speech, and mind fearlessly chop down the rotten trees and prune out the sick limbs of this country, America, and then burn the leftover trash. Wrathful but calm, austere but comic, Smokey the Bear will illuminate those who would help him, but for those who would hinder or slander him, he will put them out. Thus his great mantra, Namasamanta Vajranam Shanda Marashana Svatayam, Ham tracks, Ham Mam. I dedicate myself to the universal diamond, be this raging fury destroyed. And he will protect those who love woods and rivers, gods and animals, hobos and madmen, prisoners and sick people, musicians, playful women, and helpful children. And if anyone is threatened by advertising air pollution, television, or the police, they should chant Smokey the Bear's war spell. Ground their butts, crush their butts, ground their butts, crush their butts. And Smokey the Bear will surely appear to put the enemy out with his Vajra shovel. Now those who recite this sutra and then try to put it in practice will accumulate merit as countless as the sands of Arizona and Nevada. It will help save the planet Earth from total oil slick 
enter the age of harmony of man and nature. But when the tender love and caresses of men, women, and beasts will always have ripe blackberries to eat and a sunny spot under a pine tree to sit at. And in the end, will win the highest perfect enlightenment. Thus have we heard. been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and CFUV.UVIC.CA. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com. 